Michael Masters teaches at Montana Tech and was part of a Harvard study. Uh, this is a big debate that has been going on for years. Tell us about how you got involved with the study, first of all, and uh, what you wanted to get out of this work. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, thanks for having me on this morning, Paula. Yeah. Um, so I, the one of the lead authors on this paper reached out to me. He's um, a, a researcher at Harvard. And based on my background and interest in the UAP phenomenon, uh, I was curious if I'd want to be a part of a series of papers that investigate some potential explanations for what these might be. Mm. And um, he had already previously done a paper on extraterrestrials. And that most people are familiar with that idea that these sure. UAPs and their pilots, the occupants are coming from a different planet. Uh, he also did one on ultra terrestrials, which is a little lesser known. It's more, hmm. more of um, an ethereal sort of uh, not necessarily jiving with our space time, but they're able to come in and out of it. And it's wow. um, an idea that's been around is popularized by John Keel. And yeah, um, for last years. Well, let me ask you, first of all, what do you teach at Montana Tech and, and what is your background that led you into this field? Yeah, that's probably a good place to start. Um, I'm a biological anthropologist. I teach forensic anthropology. I do archaeological field schools. I teach quantitative methods, a number of various classes related to um, <clears throat> anthropology, sociology. And I guess what got me interested in this is how often these beings are described as looking just like that. Um, <clears throat> we're sort of at the point where we can't just talk about the craft any longer. Right. But we also have to acknowledge that there are seemingly an intelligent um, group of individuals, species that are piloting these things wow. and they're ubiquitously described as looking just like us. So well, based well, me, on let my... Me, let me go back there because I think over the last few years, people have become used to this notion because at, you know, all, the military and some congressional hearings, it was acknowledged that, yep, there are these unidentified uh, craft, as you call them, and there's no real reason to think there is not alien life. Um, so we've kind of quickly gone to a general acceptance of not just what we've seen in sci-fi in mm -hmm. the last few years, but the military acknowledging that, yeah, pilots have seen things that are unexplained. And you're saying that in your research and, and people that study this field, uh, it's gone to the actual beings themselves. Yeah, it has. And I think that's a big part of why this paper went viral internationally mm -hmm. is people are ready for that conversation. Mm -hmm. We've seen these cockpit videos so many times. We've seen the rotating one, the gimbal go fast and flare. But but what's inside? And I think mm -hmm. there's a conversation to be had there and we're starting to have that. People are taking it seriously. And like you mentioned, a mm -hmm. lot of that stems from the acknowledgement in front of Congress under oath that these things are happening. So there, this is the crypto terrestrial hypothesis, which includes, as you mentioned, aliens disguised as human beings. Yeah, so there, we listed about four different potential origins and we we're trying to capture as much variation as we could. We're not saying this is right. We're not saying that this is absolutely 100% the case. We're saying these are some potentialities. These are some possibilities right. to help explain the origins of these beings. And it, it was a large book sized paper is almost 40,000 words, 48 end notes with a lot of detail in those. So we really did try to put together yeah. something that would be palatable for everyone, but also appeal to our academic colleagues. There's also a theory about terrestrial animals that might be living underground. And my producer was saying that sounds like something from Godzilla versus Kong. You know, we're yeah. so captivated by our exposure to sci-fi. What about the underground notion? Right. Well, to, to backtrack just slightly, the crypto terrestrial idea, which yeah. is mostly popularized by an author named Mac Tawney's in the uh, 90s, early 80s, um, is the idea that there's an intelligent, advanced uh, society, civilization mm. that is sequestering itself in or around Earth, the deep oceans, underground, like you mentioned, possibly mm. the far side of the moon. Mm. And and yeah, it would be possible with advanced technology. We don't necessarily think they developed these craft underground. They may have come here from the human future, if they're extra tempestrials, I call them, or a okay. different planet, and gone underground in hiding until we're ready for contact, because we must seem extremely primitive to them based on mm. what we see flying around in the skies and these interactions we have with them. And so you're saying one of the areas of study is a being that exists in a future 
that mm -hmm. is able to come in and out of our sense of the time space continuum? Yeah, I mean, personally, I see that as the most likely scenario. We know we're here. We know we've had a long evolutionary history on this planet. And I've, I've written three books about this idea over the last five years um, that we may go on to look like them. We, based on our evolutionary characteristics over the last six to eight million years, we are arguably going to have bigger heads, smaller faces, more advanced technology. And a lot of these traits are described in association with these beings. So I think it's possible that rather than jumping forward and backward through time, constantly, they could come back through time, set up an, a civilization in or around Earth in the many places that we don't have access to yet or can explore, like the deep oceans, the far side of the moon, until recently. Now yeah. we go there. Um, so I, I see that as one of the m more likely scenarios based on the four that we proposed. That is interesting that you put forth that when we think of or we look at academic drawings of cavemen, uh, much smaller beings with much smaller skulls, mm. uh, we have evolved to this. And yeah, typically when people have mentioned or when people describe extraterrestrial beings, they do have a large head and a smaller body. Yeah, it's and importantly... <laughs> Right. Yeah. Not just that, they're upright walking. Uh, yeah. Bipedalism, we're the only habitual mm. biped on this planet among all mm. mammals. So it's highly unlikely that we would get these same characteristics that they would also be bipedal just like us, but yeah. evolve on a different planet, different distance from its sun, different gravity, different atmosphere, all mm -hmm. of these things. So the more parsimonious explanation may simply be that they're us. All right. Well, let's take a quick break. We're talking with Michael Masters about this study of UFOs, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking with Michael Masters, who teaches out uh, in Montana, but has been involved in a Harvard study involving the possibility of alien life, uh, other life in the universe. And it is interesting when you think about people that have gone from joking about little green men mm -hmm. to a, a general cultural acceptance that yeah. it does seem highly unlikely we are the only intelligent life in the universe, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and sure, if we think about this extraterrestrial model that yeah. there's other life out there, it seems logical. We continue to find planet after planet around almost every star that we study. So, yeah, yeah it's certainly a possibility. And we do consider that as one option in our mm -hmm. in our recent paper. Yeah. How, you know, it's tough. Like you said, you joined on to this paper uh, conducted by Harvard researchers without proof, without evidence. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult to have some of these theories uh, taken with credibility, taken seriously, you know, uh, it, it is a it is a avenue of scholarship, you know, that people are theorizing futurists. Um, you know, how do you approach that when you know there's going to be a certain segment of people that say, yeah, they can't believe it with that. It's Pascal's wager, right? They, right. <laughs> they're yeah. going to yeah. believe in it in case they're going to be our overlords, but nobody yeah. has proof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And and to some extent, yes, but the paper is a theoretical paper. We're not claiming there's evidence for sure. this. We're not providing, you know, data to back this mm -hmm. up. We're saying what are some possible scenarios to yeah. help explain this UAP phenomenon, which like you said, people are more open to now because okay. it's it's real. It, it's been demonstrated by the Department of Defense, the Navy, there's been testimony in front of Congress under oath. So so we're sort of getting to the point where you yeah, have still some eye rolling and some mm. giggles but honestly you know taking this seriously having conversations like this one and so i, I very much appreciate that you're willing to, to open your minds and, and provide yeah. a, a logical critique to your your viewers because it is something we should all be talking about and and you're right there has been a, a shift in the cultural zeitgeist recently mm -hmm. where we're starting to feel like it's okay to do that now where mm. previously even four or five years ago it was a very different situation Sure. Uh, interesting. The uh, some people might have seen the series Three Body Problem, uh, which is based on books, and a lot of people might be watching it right now, streaming, and that um, you know is is sort of an interesting whole series about physics. And you know that there are futurists that went back. It goes back to the uh, the the look of the self, the flip cell phone on Star Trek. Right. There are always people that can kind of. They have the ability to see into the future and theorize about what yeah. your office might look like, transportation. What's the first step in taking your experience in anthropology, uh, biology, and coming up with some of these theories about what future beings or future people might encounter? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you're right. A lot of science fiction shapes our, our thought process and understanding mm -hmm. Arthur C. Clarke, Philip K. Dick, etc. Um, for me, it was mostly trying to tie what seems to be our past, our present to our future. Because mm -hmm. the beings that come out of these craft ubiquitously are described as not just human like humanoid, but sometimes human just like us. In hmm. fact, uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, started a foundation to study these after a transformational experience he had returning to Earth oh, from wow. space. And um, they found through this study of experiencers, people who claim to have contact with these beings, that the most um, commonly interacted with form was human, just like wow. us. So so that that's where I bring my expertise and background in evolutionary anatomy, cranial facial evolution specifically, and try to see if there could be a relationship, if they could be us from the future, mm. coming back through time to visit and study their own past in the same way I would as a biological anthropologist if I had access to time travel technology. Interesting. I'm always fascinated by that French Jesuit T.R. Deschardins who seemed to predict the internet and said that in, as, a, as a Catholic theologian, he thought that the drive to create the world, what we know now is the World Wide Web. He talked about it in the 1910s and yeah. 20s. Yeah, and it kind of seems... That it, was, that it was a divine way that the earth would be more peaceful because people would be interconnected permanently yeah. so we're less likely to destroy each other. So there are interesting <laughs> theological aspects to all yeah, of these ideas absolutely. as well. And, and whether it had that effect or the opposite effect is right. yet to be seen. But I know. We're hoping. But yeah. Yes, we're right. hoping for the former and not the you latter. Know, when people uh, read about UAPs and they're thinking about this, you know, what should we do as the United States of America? We are the world's superpower. Uh, we are working on all kinds of AI technology. What do you think the Department of Defense, uh, the uh, military infrastructure, what should we be focusing on in terms of contact? Right. Well, I think there's clearly something special about these machines that they, they can do thousands of miles per hour, upwards of 10,000 G maneuvers, which seemingly are happening instantaneously and sorry, okay. instantaneously in our frame of reference, but may be slowed down. They may be manipulating space time in order to do these things. And there's some indication that that is the case based on a number of, of studies that I've looked at and written about in my second book. Hmm. But but beyond that, I think just to be open to it, instead of saying, well, these things are impossible, so we shouldn't look into mm -hmm. it at all. They're unidentified, so we mm -hmm. can't know what they are. Rather, we should take the opposite stance and say, hey, what could we learn from being open-minded to this phenomenon and recognizing that this is a highly advanced craft capable of all of these amazing maneuvers, what could we do to benefit from that? What kind of energy source is associated with this that may help us get past some global warming issues and mm -hmm. really just bring that interconnectivity in different ways. If we have something to unite around, the internet definitely makes us more interconnected. But what if we all just open our minds to the fact that there's this thing much bigger than us yeah. right now? And what can we learn from it? So I think just kind of stepping back and being open-minded to all of this and taking it seriously, but still with a critical eye. Sure, sure. Knowing the possibilities are kind of limitless here. Yeah, Michael Masters, absolutely. thanks so much for joining me to uh, talk about the study. It's really fascinating stuff. I appreciate it. Thank you, Paula. It was great talking to you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.